I'm going to get started making slabs today. I'm going to try and make it easier by cutting a fairly even slice off of my block of clay. An alternative to using the wire tool to cut is a length of dental floss. This is thicker than the thinness that I'm eventually going to roll it out to. So I'm lucky that I have a nice wood rolling pin at home that I can use to even this out. You can also use something like a smooth sided water bottle. It might help if this was filled with water so it would have a little bit more weight to it. To help my slab stay flat, I'm going to keep flipping it. When you roll it, it tends to just stretch out the top face of the slab and the underneath stays more scrunched together. So I keep flipping it upside down to even out the clay particles on both sides. It can also be helpful when you flip it to rotate it 90 degrees so that you're stretching it the long way and the short way. So I'm gonna keep flipping my slab, rotating it and rolling it on the back side. This is all about trying to keep the slab of clay as flat as possible. I'm working on the inside of a shirt box. It works great. As I roll out my clay, if I start to get a wet spot here on the cardboard, I'm gonna to move to another area so the clay doesn't stick to that wet spot. Once I have it rolled out to what I think is a good thickness, I'm gonna go over it with my rubber rib to help compress the surface. This is gonna make it stronger and tighter it's also going to help it stay more flat throughout the drying process. And I'm going to compress it on both sides. And so all of the different surface treatments that I'm going to apply to my pages are going to show up that much more vividly because the background area is going to be super smooth. So I'm just going to cut off this raggedy edge because it's a little distracting. And this is definitely big enough that I could get two pages out of it. This thickness right here is a good medium thickness. This is about 3 eighths of an inch thick. Some of the techniques we're gonna do work best on clay that's cheese hard or bone dry. So you're gonna to need to let some of these stiffen up before you can take the next steps with them. Go around with plastic and wrap the outer inch or so. Let them stiffen up like this, and this can counteract the tendency that slabs have to curl up on the edges. Scraffito is a very old form of surface decoration on clay, and it was first developed by the ancient Greeks. So if you can imagine a classic Greek vase that has maybe red and black figures or horses or red and black patterns going around it with thin scratch lines in it, that's when the Scraffito technique was first developed. I would encourage you to experiment with scratching through at different states of dryness and definitely experiment with different tools to scratch through. One thing with this Scraffito technique, it has an immediacy to it that I like. And I think working with soft clay really shows that immediate quality that it can have. You will develop your own personal style, just like your handwriting is expressive of your personality. I'm gonna do a different kind of Scraffito technique on this slab. This one is quite stiff. It's actually late, late cheese hard. I think it's starting to get bone dry around the edges. I already put down a layer of black underglaze on here and let it dry so it's not tacky wet anymore. And I'm gonna do some more underglaze painting on top of it. You might notice that these underglazes can be kind of thin. To get a really solid coat, you wanna put on several layers, but here I'm taking advantage of the thinness to have the brush stroke actually show and get a little bit of the translucency. For me, it's really more about just building layers of depth on the surface. 
and not having things look so flat like the underglazes can look. So I'm also using this carving tool to develop kind of a pattern in the background. Maybe this looks like little drops of rain or stars in the sky behind these flowers, which might make it look more like a painting or like the page from a book. So you're gonna use these pencils on bisquare. They work best on bisquare. So you have to wait until some of your pages get bisque fired first. If you're coming into Open Labs, you'll find one of these at your workstation. If you're not, just request that Ian leave you one curbside and you can pick one up to use at home. So inside this pencil is literally the exact same material that is in your little container of black underglaze, just in a pencil form. It is chalky and you're not writing on a paper surface, so it can be a little scratchy going across the clay. So one thing that will help with that is if you dip the tip of the pencil in water before you start to use it. And it just goes on much smoother. It's a little darker. Another neat thing you can do when using your underglaze pencil is just do some blending with water. The underglaze pencil is a really versatile tool. To show this off to its maximum benefit, probably just like the Scrifito techniques I was showing, I would either go over it with a clear glaze or a very light colored glaze, or if it's not a piece of functional pottery, I might choose to not use any glaze at all. I would still fire it so that it would be heat set and not rub off the surface, but some of you might want to have some surfaces on your book project that don't have any glaze on them at all. Probably though, when I do glaze fire this test piece, I'm going to try a few different options, maybe leaving some of it with no glaze, some of it with clear, and maybe I have enough area over here to try a different light colored glaze. Okay, a uh, really neat, very different kind of surface treatment technique is something called water etching, where you brush on a resist material, creating a certain pattern or imagery or writing on the clay, and then you go back over it with a damp sponge and etch away the clay background, and it will leave your pattern raised as you water etch away the background. So there's several different materials that you can use as your resist. If you're coming into Open Lab, one of the best materials to use is the wax resist that will be at your workstation. Uh, if you want to try wax resist, you can just request that Ian Beckett leave you some to pick up curbside. But other materials that work, I found just as well, that you probably have at home, include nail polish and wood glue. You need to do this technique on bone dry clay. So this is a clay slab that I made two days ago and I'm going to use one of my own small paint brushes in the nail polish because the little brush that comes inside the lid is just too um, blunt for what I want to try and this will give me more control. I'm painting with nail polish on bone dry clay and I'm going to build it up a little bit. You really should let it dry in between the coats. Let it dry and maybe put on three healthy coats. I'll also try my initials. So I'm going to let that dry and then I'm going to put on two more coats. And the same thing would hold true whether you're using nail polish or wood glue or wax resist. Feel free to experiment with any similar type product that you might have at home. So once your resist material has dried and you have it on thick enough and it's completely set, that might take a little while to build up two or three coats of it, having it dry in between. But once that happens, then you're ready for the etching part of this process. So I have a damp sponge, not dripping wet, slowly sponging away 
the background and the resist material is protecting the clay that it's covering and so I'm etching away the background and it's going to make the design raised up from the background that I'm sponging away. You need to be careful because you're working on bone dry clay and I could really easily break this right now and I'm getting it wet so if you use too much water and saturate this thing it can just dissolve in your hand. Also if you use too much water or you're too aggressive in your sponging technique you will start to lift up the resist material and I can start to see some of that is happening here on the end of this curved line that I made that nail polish is peeling up. So that's where I used so much water that it started to migrate underneath my resist material and you don't want that to happen. So just go slow and if you notice it getting very wet on the surface just stop. Let it dry out for 10 or 15 minutes and then you can come back to it. These dots right here that I put on with nail polish are becoming quite raised up and I really like that technique. It's going to make a beautiful pattern or texture underneath whatever glaze I put on top. I'm also going to ask you to make two stamps for your test pages. One made out of clay and one using the plaster chop that each one of you got. A chop generally means some type of signature stamp something that you can press into the clay to sign your work with. But it doesn't have to be your signature or your initials. It could just be a symbol that you adopt. And one neat thing you can do since you're going to have this chop tool is you could make a second chop on the back side of it. So I could have one image here and a different image here. If you're going to carve your initials or have any kind of letters on your stamps, you need to carve them in backwards as if you were looking at them in a mirror because they will be backwards when you press them into the clay. I almost always find when students make their first stamps, the lines they make are not deep enough or thick enough. So I want you to notice on this one how deep I'm carving to get a really solid drawing stamp. I want to make sure if I'm testing it out that the stamp is pretty hard, cheese hard, and my clay is quite soft. Otherwise, it would stick. Once this is bisque fired, I don't have to worry about it sticking at all. Oh, that actually looks pretty good. That's pretty vivid. Oh, I like that. I might just smooth it around on the edge and call it done. If I was concerned that this might be too thick though, I could hollow it out a little bit. A good way to hollow it out could be just to poke a series of holes in the middle part. And this is just to help it dry out some more. If you're making something with a staff part that's any thicker than this, you do need to go in and just put some holes in it so that it is not as apt to explode in the kiln firing. Another type of stamp you could make is what's called a roller stamp. I am going to take this solid stump of clay and go through the middle of it with a pencil. You could also use a paintbrush handle or something similar. And I'm going to smooth this out on my table surface and make something that's as even and smooth as possible. I don't want to make the wall of my roller too thin though because I'm going to carve a design into it. So if I can just give myself 30 seconds and sketch something out very quickly, it will be time well spent because I'm going to spend about an hour carving the surface of this roller stamp and doing that kind of quick prep work ahead of time will make this so much stronger. So you can see the kind of depth and detail I have on this one petal right here in the middle, but 
you definitely don't want to leave your lines looking like this one here where all I've done is gone in with the tip of a pencil. Those lines aren't deep enough or thick enough and they're certainly not clean enough with all of these little burrs and crumbs of clay caught in the lines. It's just not gonna give a good impression at all. Something more like that is what you're going for. I can test this out now. If it's late cheese hard, you can try it out on some soft clay. But here's one I made before that's already been bisque fired. And it's kind of just a series of lines drawn into this clay roller. So again, the stamps are gonna work best for you once they've been bisque fired. And to use it, um, I could just roll it with my fingers, but it works nicely if you can put a pencil into it and use that to help you roll it across the clay. Nice. I want you to make a second stamp out of plaster also, and all the same rules apply when you made your clay stamp as using your plaster stamp. We use plaster as material for pressing into clay because once the plaster has set, it is a very dry, chalky material. And when you push it into clay, it will release readily. Whereas the bisqueware or something else that you might press into clay might have a tendency to get stuck. Plaster releases wonderfully because it's so dry all the time. It's also incredibly strong and it's very fine grained. So you should be able to get even more detail with plaster. So let's see what this looks like pressed into clay. Ooh, that is vivid. This last decorating technique I'm gonna show you I think is the most exciting. This water slide transfer paper has been printed on a laser printer. And what happens is the laser printer toner has enough actual iron oxide in the toner so that when it's fired in the kiln, what is black becomes kind of an iron or like a sepia toned imagery on your piece. Here's a beautiful example on this mug by the ceramic artist Elizabeth Robinson. And you can see here the kind of detail work on these leaves and this kind of branch that's coming down. And she's contrasting this kind of organic imagery with some more geometric imagery also. Here's another kind of a floral pattern that she did and then she cut out these spiral or like paisley shapes. Okay, so you slide these decals onto a surface that has already been glaze fired. So you need to take one of your slabs for this project, one of your test sample pages, and send it all the way through the bisque firing and then all the way through the glaze firing. And then you're going to put your decal on it and then we're going to send it back through a third firing. And that's when the decal gets fused onto the glaze surface. So this is cut out of the decal paper and the imagery is held onto this thicker paper backing just with kind of a gel-like adhesion. So when I put this in some water, that gel adhesion is gonna dissolve and I'm gonna have just this film with the laser print imagery on it and I'll be able to slide it off of the thicker paper backing. And now I can freely move it around. I'm gonna pull this out of the water so you can see the film that has the print on it is loose from the background and I can put it on an already fired glaze surface and slide that background out. And you've got about a minute or so to reposition this on here while it's wet. I can tilt it or shift it. During that minute, you want to make sure that there are no air bubbles in between the decal and the glaze surface. I want to make sure that the decal is fully engaged and touching on the surface all the way around. If it's not down and actually making physical contact with it, if it's puckered anywhere or loose, then it's not going to um, show after the firing. So you are gonna send me 
an email attachment with what you want me to print out on this decal paper. But you're each gonna get one eight and a half by 11 sheet. On this one, you could fill in a little bit more of these background spaces. So I really encourage you to try and push around some of these techniques. Take some of the suggestions I've given for variation in them to exercise developing your own touch with it, telling your own story with it. That's the point of this whole project, is for you to tell some of your own story, to start to express yourself. As we move on to the actual book project and you start building your unique book out of clay, I'm gonna ask you to carry over at least two of these decorating techniques onto your book project, whichever two you feel most excited about. So try lots of different things at this point. These are like your sample pages. Make sure as you're finishing your pieces that on the back of everything, you put your initials and your unique number that was assigned to you. Make sure you put your initials and your unique number that was assigned to you at the start of the term. You have to have this on everything that you make this quarter. You need to make it clear and bold. So make sure that your initials are easy to read. It is absolutely required that you do this on every single piece that you wanna have fired this term. So there's lots of different techniques I've shown here. There's the scraffito technique using underglaze pencils, the water etching technique, a clay stamp, a plaster stamp, and the decals, and they go on at different points. Some of them can go right on the soft clay, like some kind of fresh scraffito techniques or on cheese hard. Your stamps you wanna use on soft clay, but you have to make the stamps first. And your clay stamps really need to get bisque fired first before you can use them on clay. The water etching technique goes best on bone dry wear, whereas the underglaze pencil goes best on bisque wear. And the decals get put on after the piece has already been glaze fired. So you're going to need to manage these slab pages that you make to do the different techniques at the appropriate stage. It's all spelled out on that assignment page in our Canvas site and follow the deadlines to get your stuff dropped off for firing at the right time, whether you're coming in for open lab and you can put them right in the kiln room yourself or if you're dropping them off curbside, follow those deadlines so you keep pace and don't let things get too far behind. Because of the different stages in which we do these different techniques, you need to keep pace with keeping them moving forward so you don't fall too far behind so you can choose what techniques you want to use for your book project.